It's the SDG Podcast. Before we get started, you can check us out on the web at solutiondesign.com slash podcast or find us on all the social medias, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Solution Design Group. All right. Today we got uh, Dan Shui joining us. Hi, Dan. And uh, we got Chad Jutner, Peter Lawrence. That's me. And me. I'm Kyle Bacher. And today we're going to talk about the trillion billion lines of code that you guys are going to go through and make efficient and small and modular and awesome line by code line. bloat. Dan, you shared an article on Slack that got everybody thinking about code bloat. Yeah, the, this is me being the crotchety old guy that's been doing this since like the <laughs> late 90s when there was no such thing as a full stack developer. There was just a web developer. And um, yeah, there was there were not all these front end frameworks. You might do a little bit of straight JavaScript, but um yeah, so the one one of the things I've noticed the project I'm on right now, which is a React, we have two and a half gigs of JavaScript dependencies in our node modules directory, which is where you put all of your JavaScript libraries in a React app. And uh, <laughs> so it struck me the first computer I had, and it was late in my career when I got one. It was the '90s, one and a half gig hard drive. So I'm like, what is going on? One and a half gig. I didn't even know that was possible it in used the '90s. To be. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember yes. the. So, there was always the like the hardware upgrades and then the software would follow it like the size and you know of your office apps and your games and all that would kind of you just have to keep upgrading to keep up with all of that yeah they seem to get more and more yeah, bloated but, more functionality but now but we're talking about like you know these the custom apps and stuff that you guys build and uh how much of that do you have to deal with so so if somebody were to say to you are all of your your javascript dependencies secure and you have two and a half gigs of them like where would you how would you even answer that question well you'd go looking for a tool that somebody wrote that tells you <laughs> that they're secure by going through each of them right and then everybody would feel better until mm -hmm. the data until the data breach happens <laughs> Well, I deal with this all the time, though. We do have tools that actually identify vulnerabilities, and they cross-check your 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 dependencies against, you know, NIST databases and all these other vulnerability databases. And wonderful, I love it. Every time I find a new vulnerability and a dependency that I pull in, be it a JavaScript framework or a Java library or anything, um, it always improves velocity and makes things everybody i know none of that happens i hate it Man, i mean we pull in so much garbage well, not garbage right but like we see like you know hey i don't want to check if an array list is empty i'm going to use this apache commons library that's going to do the null check and the empty check and make sure it's actually populated with blah 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 and i'm like man sometimes uh Bloat is just pulling in a dependency on another library to do something that you could have just done yourself a lot and um, that library you pull in does not just the one little thing that you wanted to, but like probably a thousand other things. And one of those and the odds of those thousand things all being done in a safe manner are practically nil. So what am well, I and, saying? Well, well, and how well, many it, of those thousand things are you using? Right. Well, in defense of the JavaScript okay. bloat, there is this process that prunes stuff that's supposed to go through and figure out which code is actually getting executed and try not to load stuff that's not and that kind of thing. But I don't yeah, know but how the well. minute the minute you pull that library into your framework and maybe you do the like the uh, what is it the minify thing where it actually does prune everything else out and only deploys what you're using. It I don't know. I we've gotten things are weird right now. It feels like with all of the nervousness around data breaches with all of the tools around checking for vulnerabilities and all of the things that we plug into our ci cd pipelines to make sure that we're deploying safe secure um right code that has proper test coverage that has proper everything it's 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 a miracle that we can actually deliver products kind of a timeline I mean, yeah. uh, it seems like software developers in our hearts um mostly <laughs> for ourselves and we do this to ourselves. A very depressing podcast episode. Yeah. Well, okay. It's, yeah, let's turn it around. You went a little dark. I mean, <laughs> it is well, a I was challenge. Just, I was just I was just having this conversation with one of my buddies on my project. I'm like, man, we developers don't hate anybody as much as we hate ourselves, right? And we just constantly do it to ourselves. And we do it with a smile on our face saying, hey, we're going to make our lives better. This one little library, this one extra little thing, it's going to make everything just slightly better. And then... Well, the, the, the other part of that too, though, is 
in defense of us programmers, um, the guy behind Stack Overflow had an article years back. I think it was him. Don't quote me. Um, it's either him or Joel Spolsky or somebody, but had a had a, a blog post titled "Nobody is smart enough to program," and <laughs> he made a really good case that. We're really not like evolution did not prepare us to program computers and so we're doing our best and yeah there's smart people in the software development industry but nobody can keep track of gigabytes of switches which are what bits are right if you string 50 trillion bits together each one is a logic gate nobody can possibly wrap their head around um what's happening really. You're, and that's why right. we have high level languages, which make it a little easier, but it's, you know, I think you're, you're talking about Jeff Atwood. Is that, that's Jeff the guy, Atwood, right? I believe so. Yeah. I believe it was. Jeff Atwood. His, yep. and that's he had a, a deep blog cut. Called, <laughs> yeah. and he had a blog called coding horror, coding horror. Yep. I believe that that's right? right. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, you can uh, find out yeah. why nobody is smart enough to program. I do remember reading something along those lines. And at the time, though, I was building things that were magnitudes of like magnitudes of scale smaller than what I'm doing today. And I kind of read that. I was like, come on, man, really? Um, and now today I'm like, oh, God, right. Like we're building. I mean, not only are we producing uh, code at a rate that is insane, but like just building applications that are much, much larger than I mean, at least I am doing things that are much, much larger than anything I've done before my oh, career, yeah. like easily 10 times as big as yeah. you know, my next biggest project. And I actually did. Um, there's a number of tools out there. So we're talking about code bloat specifically, I think, right? Um, yes. There's a lot of tools out there to count lines of code, right? And there's actually, speaking of code bloat, there's a software project out there on GitHub that le literally does for the type of project you know for the language that you're typing that you're um it's i think it's literally called loc lines of code he goes out there and he does you know analysis on how many lines of this project are actually your code and i did one and it turns out that um i'm working on something uh we've written war and peace um eight times over now we're on nice. our um ninth and that's code that we've actually written ourselves. And if you think about that, though, that's insane. Like, that is absolutely bonkers. And uh, we're still adding to it. All right. Let me ask the old developers on here. What's what's the smallest project that you worked on professionally? Um, uh, probably a, a brochure website for my first gig for STG, which, which was basically a static HTML site. Nice. Nice. My, my um, first gig was probably, I don't know, we had tools at that time because we were doing you know dynamically linked libraries and you know a lot of other c plus plus and i've just gone up from there chad you were going to say yeah i wrote um so i used to support infrastructure for um a large local retailer and they had a support staff so i used to like there's probably the smallest deliverable i've ever written um wrote in Perl using cgi.pm if you guys remember that oh yeah CGI, yeah yeah so i wrote a tool for our offshore team that was literally just like eight big buttons that they could press <laughs> to do certain things because i didn't trust we didn't trust them with full access but it was basically like just like restart this um flush this cache um flush our connection or flush our jwc pool. like i wrote it that was the smallest thing i think i've ever wrote it in Perl. um yeah did you did you did you write it straight Perl? were there other Perl libraries that you brought in or cgi pm baby i don't know why we needed any other web development libraries after cgi pm <laughs> it was all in there we had routing we had nothing else <laughs> nothing else I had a whole there lot you go. Of, see, see that's what Google should be. It should just have two buttons. One should say "Show me cat videos," and the other one should say "other." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it does have. It has got a, a button that says "I'm feeling lucky." Is that yeah. still there? Uh, yeah, it's still there. So here's another alarming statistic. Um, I remember yes. seeing. I don't know if anybody knows Uncle Bob. He's kind of well known in the tech speaking community, and he was at Minnesota Developer Conference years years ago before the COVID times. And uh, I saw him speak and he brought out this chart, this exponential curve that depicted the number of software developers since 1960. In, this, in 1960, it was in the hundreds worldwide. Now it's, of course, in the millions. And he showed that every five years, 
since 1960, the number of software developers roughly doubles, which means that at any given time, half of everybody in the development community has less than five years of experience. Wow. So we're throwing a lot of inexperienced people growing exponentially onto these ever-growing code bases. So you have more code and more people that don't know that much about code working on it. So, so that's part two, dev bloat. Yeah. You have. <laughs> well, the, conversely, though, like you have probably uh, you're going to have a huge drop off of people retiring and brain drain, right? Like, I mean, I've I, I don't think I'm speaking out of school here when I say between Dan, Peter and I, we've all been doing this since the 90s and we're probably heading toward we're within the last decade of we're, our We're a little software. tired. Yeah. Yeah. A little, a little long in the tooth look at how much smoke is in your office dan i feel like I you are more than a little tired uh you know you, you do what you do to cope chad you yeah just... man, crack a window um but <laughs> it uh i mean all of our experience is going to leave with us right um and it's a little different for us like right like we're not we're consultants so we don't stick around at any given company for longer than you know a handful of years, right. but like a lot of these large organizations, I have buddies that are retiring now from huge local, like fortune 100 companies in Minneapolis, they're retiring and they're bringing with them, they're retiring with them a ton of like domain expertise, knowledge and everything else. And they're passing that on to somebody like Dan said with five years experience. And that's, right. um, it's, it's, it's an interesting problem. Um, but it, and those people with those tiny little bit of experience are going to start patching to the best of their ability these massive code bases out there and um it's not gonna go well i mean so this is just a story to be able to participate in this conversation as somebody that is low code um, i see this with wordpress plugins i see this with nintex workflows you know where you got way too many actions, way too much going on. Maybe your project was where you had a constant flow of change of requirements and you're refactoring yeah. your all the time and you end up with a big Frankenstein um, and it affects the performance and you're using tools. You're using third party tools and you don't control the code base for those tools. So it's, um, you know, I think it's a challenge. You know, it's a challenge we face where we, you know, throw in a plug-in and our pages slow down. <laughs> and, you know, it's like how much do you, com you know, it's like I hope you don't commit too much to this. Um, but if you go all in on something to do your design and and uh, all of that kind of held hostage, and then you're one update away from a problem. Well. Well, and low code doesn't mean there's not a ton of code. It means right. wh what you're using, you presumably don't have to write a lot more code, but somebody already wrote a ton of code for your right. code solution. So right. how much of this is shortcuts? Like, I'm just going to add this library that does it for me, but it also does a billion other things that I'm not going to use. It's a, it's a lot of it. I mean, that's kind of why the Linux kernel was built the way it was. It was supposed to be like super modular, so you could just pick and choose little parts. But um, the 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 world, the internet, the web development has not followed the principles of the Linux kernel development community. <laughs> you know, JavaScript, to be fair, was a language that was written over a weekend, right? So... And it wasn't How? supposed to be the language of the World Wide Web. That's and not yet, what it was intended for. But here we are. So, yeah. yeah, so I do. And sometimes you don't even realize it, right? So I do a lot of Java development, and I use a lot of a thing called the Spring Framework, right? And the fr Spring Framework is it's the de facto standard for, for Java applications. But you pull in a library from the Spring Framework, and you might not even realize that you're pulling in you know, half a dozen additional libraries that the Spring Framework has obfuscated for you. You know, right. like you're, you're you're doing something in the Spring Framework, and all of a sudden it's pulling in, you know, the Apache Commons HTTP client. You're pulling in um, uh, Hikari JDBC pools. You're pulling in all these other libraries that you know. I mean, at this point, you're you're kind of cognizant of what they are, and you know, all of all of what you're kind of signing up for if you have any kind of experience. But um, if you don't, then it's really easy to have um, just this massive code base just for a simple, you know, API, right? Like your yeah. Hello World API probably has hundreds of thousands of lines of open source code associated to it just for the Java framework itself. Right. I, I saw a, um, somebody did a, a post on some of the biggest software projects and code bases in the world. Google is up there. I mean, they have 
literally billions upon billions upon billions of lines of code um, across all their services. NASA is not, which is amazing to me, like is not as, you know, it, it takes less code to, to launch a space shuttle. And we've known this, right? Like the old joke about the having more horsepower in your pocket than most space shuttles have in the last however many years. The, the, the TI-83 calculator I read had more computing power than the Apollo 13 moon mission. Right, right. But I think they're kind of, I think it's more, there's more to it than that, right? Because delete and trim everything, right? Like you're not going to send the spring framework into outer space. No. Because, no. you know, we're, it's not a... No. And we're not doing firmware. We're not doing, you know, writing code for automatic braking, anti-lock braking systems or airplane navigation systems. We're doing business software, which is its own nightmare you know and and bloat <laughs> bloat is not nobody really pays attention to bloat in the business enterprise software space like they There's do no in the field too. there, there well there crazy. is there is it's in all these data breaches and stuff because nobody knows what all this code is doing but people choose to ignore it just like we kind of choose to ignore you know the highway deaths we it's the price we pay for having a automobile based society and everybody's like well there's a there's like space in the vacuum left to fill you know you look at performance it's like well it's still performing just fine so we're good you know it works we're fine you know you do a project from start to finish you tie in the libraries how much does the do you want to spend how much time how much money do you want to spend going back and doing you know code reviews and refactoring and all of that you're, you're up against a deadline you know, you, yeah. it's like, give us something that works and then we can move on. I mean, right. simply, Go ahead. simply looking at technical debt, not considering all of the technical debt that we're acquiring along the way from other libraries, just your own tiny code base, your nine copies of War and Peace. There's some technical debt in there, right? The, the edit, I mean, who knows how long War and Peace was in the rough draft, but I'm guessing the editor tightened it up a bit. Do you think there was an editor for War and Peace? Dude. <laughs> yeah. That dude, somebody that dude that didn't edited. leave anything out. <laughs> okay. So we've identified where Code Bloat started. It started with War and Peace. <laughs> I just think, I mean, we, we say it in such negative terms. We are, we're pulling in things, honorable intentions, right? We have good intentions. We're trying to, we're trying to be mildly more efficient. We're trying to be um we're trying to gain some velocity we're trying to do a lot of things don't create the wheel right that's been a, a mantra in programming yeah yeah if you can find a, a package that does it well um, and, and so that's that's a huge benefit you know the modular stuff and pre-built things you can tie into and that's gonna speed up your project but there's going to be a cost yep. at some point. Double-edged sword. Is there? Well, that's yeah, the you, question. You don't, you don't know what it's doing. Your professionals that maintain your software systems can't possibly know what all those modules are doing. Yeah. So how, I mean, so we go back to um, hardware components and, and the room size computers of discrete components so that we know everything that it's doing? Well, we, we're beyond, like, again, nobody's smart enough to program. Nobody, we, we weren't designed or we, <laughs> we simply don't have the capacity to understand everything that's happening in a modern software system. It's beyond right. human capacity. Yep. At this point, there's no going back. The genie's out of the bottle. And it's, I mean, to your point, Peter, like, I don't want to write straight JDBC queries anymore. No. Right? JPA and um, ORM and all those tools have made um, made our lives easier. Right. Now, I don't necessarily know that I need everything that Hibernate or whatever package you're using for ORM has to offer. Um, but I do know that I like calling um, um simplified repository like I, I like that a lot better than having to implement my own find all or my own find by id or my own all of this stuff right ad nauseum um those libraries and those tools have made all of that stuff um all of like those have actually helped the problem right it's made the mm -hmm. load less that said <laughs> i mean um if there's ever if there's ever an issue with you know, like a core library like that, like Hibernate for, for us Java developers. And I think yep. there's there's a .NET version of it as well. I've, and Hibernate, yeah. There you go. If there's ever a vulnerability in that thing, I mean, that's where it's almost like a Y2K problem. It's such an ubiquitous 
a big a big you, to us you big big to us you big you big you big with us thank you my gosh it's not even me you big with us you big with us it's such a ubiquitous library this is like um it's like the log for j thing that we had a couple of years ago right. remember that like yep. that library was so ubiquitous yeah. that it caused i mean it yeah, was a almost a national that. crisis and i think the the incentives are all misaligned really because you know the business wants to see added functionality right they always do so that's what we all get incentivized to produce but it's kind of, i remember like reading something about after 911 and there's all this hand wringing and what could the intelligence community have done and somebody pointed out that you know the the person that like prevents 9-11 from happening never gets recognized because it was a non-event, right? So, right. but then the people that dropped the ball supposedly when 9-11 happened get crucified. So the, there's no incentive for me as a software developer really to spend a ton of time trying to figure out what could go wrong with our software in place of delivering new functionality that the business can see when I do a demo next Friday. Well, that was the <laughs> same argument with Y2K, right? Like everybody, after Y2K happened, um, some of the dumbest people in the world were like, what was the big deal? Like nothing bad happened. You guys were all worried over nothing, which is exactly <laughs> what you're saying, Dan. Like they glossed over the fact that so many of us worked ridiculous hours in right. order to make sure that like, <laughs> Yeah, you know why nothing happened? Because we worked really hard. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to recognize success when when you see that it worked, right? You you watch Australia or I forget who was the first first time zone to go, but you you're <laughs> watching them on TV and nothing happens and you're like, "Oh, phew, we did it. We made it." No, we don't have to yeah. roller skate to work or anything. Yeah. Remember that? Don't don't dial 911 on midnight on the 2000 because <laughs> we'll bring the whole 911 system down and like <laughs> I remember nine, people nine were like one system. Did you read Wired magazine in the late 90s like there were software developers like, yes, I'm learning how to tan hides because I work on railroad switches and there's no way they're going to make railroad switches. So all the railroad, all the railroad cars are going to fly off the foot. Like it was just bonkers. The yeah. things that people were doing and some of those guys probably rightly so. Right. Like I know um, my brother worked for a large local bank and uh, some of the hoops that they had to jump through to make sure that everybody still had a balance of uh, <laughs> whatever was in their checking account on January 1st of 2000. Like. That was a lot of freaking work. Yeah. So, I, so I wonder if we're going to see uh, like a black swan event in the software industry, like 9/11, like so, something that wipes out a major bank to the point where they don't know how to recover people's accounts or something in order to like send a wake up call about the problems and the you know the the growing exponentially growing software landscape. Well, I think you have. You, know, you look at something that is highly treasured and and there's i don't think there's anything more highly treasured than actual treasure and it's being watched and everybody knows you know it's like you know kind of how much money you got or you should and the banks are keeping an eye i mean there's a lot of eyes on money so you hope that there's enough attention there to prevent any you know these issues from happening well but yeah the but, black but swan event is hands. something that's so rare that's so far-fetched before it happens like you know it's it's do you want to go through life worrying about every possible black swan event that's going to happen like you can't you, know, you well, can't no, black, achieve perfection that way a black swan event is by definition an event that nobody could have imagined or that nobody could have seen coming. That's the definition of a black swan event. And they do happen and they will happen. Statistically, they always happen. They're just rare. Yeah, I mean, and the money thing, money these days, what is it even? It's <laughs> it's electronic pulses in computer systems. That's all it is. Gold. It's magnetized <laughs> partitions in physical media somewhere are we going to start talking about nfts again good <laughs> i don't think uh so, yeah nobody's talking about it but right right now the banks are <laughs> eating the losses when there's breaches i mean it's not just banks data breaches cost companies money right and so i'm sure that yep. a lot of them got insurance which is one of the problems that happened in 2008 where all these banks had these questionable like loans and like i don't think these are any good i'm gonna like buy some insurance to, so somebody else can eat it if they're bad and so i'm sure people are doing that with data breaches and stuff because that's expensive you know it can severely damage your and 
we see it all the time, and it's kind of like people are kind of used to it now, it seems like. but And those breaches are because of the bloat. The code it's base is so it. large. It's part of it. So then there's the arms race between the white hats and the black hats and they're almost the like QAing your security by exploiting these vulnerabilities and then patching. Like a lot of these vulnerabilities, yes, there's the log4j thing, which was horrific. And then there's probably going to be another one. I know I forget what the previous log4j type event was. The worm? Um, I, the I love you virus? That wasn't. Monkey bee? Um, but it's not even, I mean, some of these aren't even necessarily related to software bloat. Like what was the, somebody just posted something about the local ISP that got hacked, right? Yeah. And they got yeah. hacked. Yeah. What was, there was, um, US internet. From, yeah. US internet. A whole bunch crimes. of emails from the last, I don't know how many years got. Yeah. And they didn't necessarily exploit a hole in software. What did they do? They like one of the URL things, the URL checkers they exploited to get into their system. I forget exactly the, the vector that they used to access all that stuff. Uh, and that US internet is not, a bad company. I mean, I, I've worked with them in the past on a few occasions and, you know, they seem to me to really have their act together. I think, I think this can happen to anybody. That's, that's the point. It's like, it's beyond, beyond our capacity to understand these systems to the extent that we can say confidently that there aren't major security vulnerabilities in them. Well, I think you, you know, you have to take reasonable precautions. You got to have a lock on your door. You know, you got to have a, a light on your front step. You know, you just have to have these things. But that doesn't mean somebody can't, like, come up to your front door with a sledgehammer and get in. For sure. And then what if you have a house that has 10 million doors? That's what our software is getting to be like. <laughs> that's a, Actually, that's a pretty great analogy, right? Like, you, yes, having a lock on your door is a very sane and reasonable solution to protecting your house. What about your window? What about this? I mean... What's in your house? How valuable are your belongings inside your house? Can somebody just throw a brick through your window? That's what happens. That's a great analogy for what happens with, I mean, if I was a bank, yes, I'm not going to have glass windows. I'm going to have bars and all this other crap on my windows. That is what software is like. It's, um, it's, it's uh, all of the tools, all of the, all of the things that we're encountering writing business software um, are our best attempts at locking additional doors putting bars on our windows and everything else. And as much as it sucks, it's uh, the alternative is. Yeah. So with and code, I, what are the reasonable, you know, measures you should take to, and not just security, but to handle the bloat, you know, do you have rules you have to follow? Do you have a, like, as you're I, developing, what do you do to kind of mitigate that stuff and take those reasonable precautions? I, I mean, as an individual developer, I try to write what I consider to be elegant code, you know, the minimum amount of code I need to write to solve the, you know, the requirement at hand. But, you know, I'm just one. And again, I think there's just too many doors now. Nobody knows if they're all locked. Is there any good news? Um, I mean, it's started, maybe it's starting to... Like, again, I've started seeing this stuff show up in my news feed, which is curated by an algorithm that I don't really know very much about. So I don't know if that says more about me than it does about the culture at large. They're Maybe we're hitting a tipping Dan. point. I don't really know. But um, at some point, you know, the drum beats, you know, people, it's going to be it's like in what Chad pointed out, there's going to be a wave of retirements. And are there going to be enough people left to like prop up all of this stuff? Because software doesn't die. It tends to grow in one direction only. And like, it's the rule of entropy. It's just the more software you have, the more um, you, you, know, you the, have. The, well, the, the less order, it's harder to impose order on it, I guess. I kind of wonder, Dan, if like all of the vulnerabilities and all of the common sense things that we do, right, as almost second nature, will become fresh vulnerabilities once our generation retires. I'm trying to think of an example of some of these. Um, gosh darn it, I can't. SQL like, like injection, encrypt, encrypting yeah. passwords, basic basic input sanitation, uh, SQL injection, all of that stuff. Not putting your um, passwords in your code. Password. I mean, passwords are going to become a thing of the past anyway. But like, um, yeah, like all of those, all of the common sense things that we just kind of do and build around. Um, I wonder if that's going to become a brand new vector for you know. Uh, for the next generation to attack because they are all retired, you know, like, yeah, 
I, I mean, there, there is some good news. Like we've got an automated Veracode scan that runs. I just had to fix a uh, issue that Veracode found where we were taking a, an ID from user input and using that to call an external API and with a query string. And the Veracode is like, hey, like you didn't check this input to see if they're like creating a malformed url when this thing goes to your third-party api so i'm like hey good <laughs> good catch so so i basically called this other team and said hey we're using an id from your system can you tell me every character i can expect to see in that id formatting so that i can do a regex to make sure there's nothing other than those so there there's some good news there's some you know th that that was a good catch i mean honestly the automated tools have come so far, AI is probably going to play a, a role in that, yep. right? Um, as you tell the AI what's bad code, it it can go through the billions of lines of code and look for that, right? Instead of having a, a human go through it. And yeah. hopefully your UI doesn't, you know. Yeah. It's like trying to find a spelling error in War and Peace. Can you just... Peter, can you just start on page one? <laughs> I'm just going to slowly page through it, look at all the words, and make sure they're all spelled correctly. Yeah, please do that. Well, I think, you know, with the, um, the worries about AI, you know, there's also great hope. You know, we talk about the generations that are, you know, aging out and who the torch is getting handed to. You know, they'll, they have better tools and all of this stuff available to them. You know, they're starting with that advantage. The disadvantage is that they are in the world of, you know, they're in the results of the code bloat that's come before them that they have to deal with. But hopefully the tools and the AI will kind of cover that gap right. so that, you know, businesses don't just shut down because there's no one that can like keep their stuff running. Well, well, it's an economic issue for businesses too. And it's at some point they'll realize that because I, I was at a client years ago and they had a BizTalk implementation that was taking new registrations and feeding stuff into a table in a database when people signed up for this particular client. Um, nobody, they were paying BizTalk licensing fees and nobody knew what it was for. So they actually asked me, I got permission to do kind of moonlight for them via SDG to do like a side project to replace the BizTalk thing with a web a a REST API um, so they could stop paying those licensing fees. So we did that. That was fine. They let it run for a year on my new API thing before somebody figured out that nobody used the data at all and they didn't need it for anything whatsoever. And so then they had a mock funeral for this thing, um, for this piece <laughs> of software, which was called the master person table. But they were spending thousands of dollars a year to feed data to this table that nobody needed, but nobody knew if they needed it or not. That's another problem with bloat. Yeah, that's true. You know, getting getting tools that control how many times this table has ac been accessed in the last year is probably right around the corner. Then we have content bloat. You know, there's so much content. Um, AI is going to make that worse. I just, you know, did a little exercise today. Uh, Peter um, mentioned my broken Yeti microphone that we used when we first started our podcast. And I found like 20 videos addressing design flaw that it had, where if you turn it the wrong way, pulls on the USB cord and bends it and wrecks the port. And like, did that many videos need to be made about that one problem? 20 different ways to change a tire. So back yeah, to you... code bloat, what, what are the like reasonable steps? What do you do, you know, as you're developing, going through that process? Refactor, code reviews. Um, that's that's really. Yeah. I mean, we had a yeah. at OSN last year. We had a wonderful presentation by a developer at one of our local companies, and I think basically what he was getting at is like one of the most wonderful things to do as a developer is to delete code. Um, yeah, so fun. It's 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 your best. It's your best tool against bloat is deleting code refactoring out common themes in code i mean this might this borderlines on anti-patterns kind of but like build your own string utils i mean i think a lot of the things that we pull in are convenience methods from open source libraries so we use i mean i'm a big fan of apache commons or i had been in the past um so i'll, bo I'll pull in an entire util for like string utils yep. um there's three or four different libraries now that I pull in just for logging. Um, do you need them all? I mean, maybe one of your best tools right now to prevent 
bloat is um, just to reevaluate what you really need. You know, like I kind of go on autopilot with fresh projects. I'm like, oh, yes, obviously I need spring. I need boot, spring boot. Spring boot's going to pull in SLF for J. SLF for J is going to be a facade for this other library. And that other library is going to probably need to pull in this if I'm, you know, like all of that nonsense. Just right. stop for a minute and um, re-educate yourself on what the true necessities are. Maybe you'll find out that autopilot mode that we've been on for a little bit isn't always the most efficient, you know. Right, um, right. People are not questioning sport. things enough, I feel like. Me and Yeah, exactly. It's, you're, you used a lot less words to say what I was trying to say. Thank you. <laughs> Do you vet the libraries you're using? Via via static code analysis and stuff and like community source like but no, I mean not can you look through a library and understand it? No, not really. No, and compilers of old and JavaScript, you know, compilers and, and minimizers and things like that are doing their, their work to pull out the things that you're not using before it goes out. So you may see 2.5 gigabytes of node modules, but you're... Yeah. You're, they're not all getting loaded. Yeah, they're not all. You're not loading that onto somebody, somebody's computer every time they load your website. That would be, but but, fun. but there, but there is a cost. Even though that's certainly true, and there's good software solutions for that kind of problem. It's still from a developer when you come into a project that's just massively sprawling. It's taxing right. cognitively that from a developer perspective, and that has economic costs too, because true. it's hard for a new developer to come in and feel confident about what they're doing in your system if there's a million moving parts so keeping things simple the the kiss principle is always the way to to go right yeah and think about the people that are coming after you just you know what is it going to be easy for them to understand what's going on because um otherwise you're just being selfish man if it was hard for me it should be hard for them too come on <laughs> yeah We've heard yeah. that mantra from a few few old developers i suffered you should have to suffer too i I mean, I've worked with guys that have been supporting the um, the exact same software product at a large company. And it's amazing. Like, I'm, I'm continually impressed by, one, their ability to recall, you know, like things they did 20 years ago. But also, I mean, there's entire swaths of code where they're like, oh, I forgot about I don't remember this. And I think that's yeah. one of the biggest one of the biggest like things that we have to guard against is like make your code base modular enough so that it's supportable right like yeah um it's i i don't know i mean microservices kind of help with this a little bit like having discrete things happening all over the place but like these dudes when you build a monolith you're building a monolith and you've got like basically like two guys supporting the entire taj mahal and that's not a recipe for success so yeah. hey so i was so, on the open i was on the open source a North committee to look through the speakers. I saw some of the talks, um, and one of them is about the return of the monolith. The, the pendulum is swinging the other way. People are getting burned out on microservices now. Yeah, yeah. So I've, some yeah. parting thoughts. Um, you know what I'm what I'm getting from this is that there's some kind of inevitability, and you know it's like just the expectations uh, that's put on developers. Um, in this in this world we find ourselves in you know i think can be misaligned um and give them a break <laughs> you know it's like it's the same everybody's everybody's swimming in this pond it's not there i don't think there's an easy answer for it all right my parting thought is be part of the solution not part of the problem don't don't look do look for code bloat do delete things do get rid of code don't just let it sit there because well I don't really know what it does, so I'm just going to ignore that rather than I'm going to dig into that and see if we really need it. Lock your doors, <laughs> box on your windows. Yeah, be vigilant. Chat. Ask ask questions. Yeah, yeah. I I don't really have a parting thought. That's <laughs> all right. I think with that uh, we can we can wrap it up. All well, right. Fun talk. Say see goodbye, you. everybody. Goodbye, goodbye everybody. See ya. Solution Design Group is a digital product consultancy in Minneapolis. Check us out on the web at solutiondesign.com or look for us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram at Solution Design Group.